do like to stand as we read the word of God like Ezra had the people stand in the book of Nehemiah to give honor to the word of God. So why don't you stand along with me. There are pews, or I know there's pews, there are Bibles in the pews in front of you, the New King James Bible, but the text itself is found in the PowerPoint. So you can look up at the screen, or if you've brought your own Bible, I think that's always a great thing to get in the habit of bringing your own Bible. And uh, we do try to encourage passing out bulletins. Uh, they have a place where you can take notes and um, help you to go home and maybe review and go over the message. We're gonna be reading out of Luke, the 22nd chapter. Luke, the 22nd chapter, and verses 31 through 34. It says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have strengthened, or excuse me, returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can be in your house today. And Father, what a joy to be together worshiping you collectively. We know, Father, that you died for the church. It's the pillar and the ground of the truth. And Father, we pray that we would continue to be faithful to it. And we pray for folks, Lord, that we lift up in prayer all the time that we love, that they also would be faithful to your house if they're not presently being faithful. Lord, please drive your word home to our hearts. We know that it will never return void. It will always accomplish your purpose and your pleasure. And that's pretty great to hear. And we thank you that faith does come by hearing. And hearing by the word of God, this is a supernatural book that we will get to look at this morning. And we thank you for that. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. You can be seated, folks. Thank you. I have uh, somebody having a baby, Ruth. I noticed the little crib you put up here on the platform. No? Oh, okay. That's good. How many here have ever failed? Okay, a couple of you, not yet. Well, that's good to know. That's good to know. I have hours for counseling that you can come see me, and uh, we will discuss that with you. But I am preaching on being allowed to fail. And I have to preface my remarks by telling you I am a tremendous Apostle Peter fan. Uh, I feel like he gets a bum rap most of the time. I know he was impulsive. I know people talk about him putting his foot in his mouth and saying things, doing things, jumping into situations that he jumped a little bit too quickly. But I always pray that certain people in my life would do something so many people do nothing. And it's great to see somebody like Peter who is able to cry out, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's so great to see the resurrected Christ and them coming to the tomb, which was now empty. And John beat him there because he was a younger man. But it was Peter who went in. I always thank God that it was Peter who wanted to step out of the boat and walk on the Sea of Galilee towards Christ, even though the distractions caused him to look away and to start to sink. I like that even at the Mount of Transfiguration, as misled as Peter was, he said, it's a good thing that we're here, Lord, and here's what we ought to do. At least he was a man of action, 
And we are kind of following the life of Peter as we talk about being chiseled by Almighty God. God has to chisel off the rough edges. And that doesn't stop after you've known Christ for 10 years or 20 years or 50 years. Uh, I am 64 years old now, and I mention to Karen all the time, wow, I think I'm doing this better, finally. I think I'm finally getting the point. I think I'm learning to listen a little bit more because you know I love to talk. But I'm learning to listen a little bit better. God continues, call it sanctification, to chisel away the rough edges through our life. You know best what your rough edges are. You look in the mirror, and the Bible tells us the mirror is the Word of God. And we should look intently so that we don't forget what manner of person we are so that changes can be made. In our text, it doesn't imply that we will never fail. Jesus is simply telling Peter, I am praying, Peter, that your faith will not fail. Amen? And there is a big difference because James 1.4 says, let patience have its perfect work. It means as you learn, as you grow, even as you fail, understand what's taking place and receive it the right way and grow through the process. Peter and the events of his life are what we're following in the next couple of weeks as we see God chiseling away at the rough exterior in him and becoming a new creation in Christ. And that can start when, if you receive Christ at 10 years of age or if you're 80 years of age, God wants to chisel away at those rough edges. But I have some questions. How about you? Some questions that intrigue me sometimes. I think sometimes we would have all been happier if we were created robots. And Christ just wound us up and sent us off in a direction and told us what we were going to say, what we were going to do, where we were going to go, where we would not go. And he would keep us from sinning and falling short. But he created you to love you. And there is always a testing. We could not demonstrate true love if we were robotic in the way that we walked and talked and how we spoke. We have to reach out to God from our hearts. And we have to give forth that expression of love with the Lord. Now, I have noticed, I don't know if I brought it with me today. Let me take a little peek. I might not have. I had something really cool. And naturally, it's not with me. But years ago, I preached on some foolish things that Christians do to stunt their growth. And uh, some of the things we're talking about living our life by feelings and not by faith. Some of it was living an isolated life and not getting together with other believers, and we need strength and encouragement by being with other people. Another one talked about living a very shallow life as a Christian and never going deep. And I preached about three or four of those things about three years ago, but I have about ten of them. So they might be emerging at some point so that our growth is not stunted as believers. Herein lies the problem, and I'll read this verse to you, Galatians 5 and verse 17 says, for the flesh, if you're taking notes, lusts against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh so that you cannot do the things that you want to do because they are contrary to you. They're against our human nature. And that's why God is involved in the chiseling operation. Paul said it best in Romans 7, verses 15 through 25. And you could say it in your own words this morning. The things that I don't want to do are the things I find myself doing. 
And the things that I want to do are the things I find myself not doing. And Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this flesh? I know, folks, you come up to me and you say, Satan made me do this, and Satan made me do that. And I, in a little bit of a sarcastic way, say, don't flatter yourself. It is not Satan who is personally following you around from point A to point B. It's probably not even demonic activity, although it can be. Satan kind of gets us rolling in the wrong direction, and our flesh takes over. And it becomes a habit. And we end up in the trenches that we don't want to be in. And we have to be extremely careful, because I think Satan gets the ball rolling, and then he walks away, and we keep the ball rolling. We fail many times in life, and I want you to realize today that's not such a bad thing. It's all a matter of how we receive failure and what we do with it. So we're going to consider some things this morning. We're going to notice God's ways as he chisels away at us and allows us to fail. And I'm going to say something that's just going to blow you away this morning. This is not a speech. This is preaching. When we preach, we are trying to move people to do something. Amen? I am not a motivational speaker, even though I like to motivate you. But I understand in this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, Christ has overcome the world. I want us to learn how to live in the midst of this world. It's more difficult now than it's ever been before. And I believe we should preach the whole counsel of God. We shouldn't hold back anything. Or I shouldn't have my hobby horses that I preach my favorite stuff. I love preaching on God's love. I love preaching on the grace of God. We're doing a lot of that around here, talking about the grace of God. But I'm kind of like uh, what Charles Stanley said when he said most of the Bible is negative but we can preach the negative in a positive way. You never want to leave people wounded and bleeding in the pews and not give them the remedy. Not tell them what they can do to make things right. As you witness, as you're salt and light, and you talk to people about Christ, you've got to give them the solution. You can't just tell them, you know, if you died right now, you're going to hell, and walk away and say, have a good lunch. Uh, that doesn't work real well. We want to show them what God can do. And guess what? We weren't always right with God. We're just beggars. You know I say this a lot, showing other beggars where to find bread. And I think that's what we should be about. So anyway, the first thing I want to bring to your mind is it's entitled From Humility to Arrogance. Has that ever happened? Have you ever had a mood swing like that? When I was at Taunton State Hospital, we called it a personality disorder. A lot of people were bipolar. I had to watch what I said, what I didn't say, what I said, because I could stir people up so easily. And all I had to do is stir someone up, and I would be in a little room with doctors. And I would be in a little room with psychologists. And I would be in a little room with social workers telling me what I could say and what I couldn't say, and we would go back and forth because I would tell them, my springboard is Jesus. And I know the name Jesus is a deal breaker with you. If you don't want me doing this, send me on my way. But I am going to do this from my heart, not condescending, not with antagonism, but with a heart of love. That's what I do as a chaplain. And God protected me for some three years over at Taunton State Hospital while I was also pastoring Colonial. Three quarters of a mile away, didn't God work miracles? And we thank God for that. But we can move from humility to arrogance. Luke, the fifth chapter, and verse 8. This was our text last week, part of it. Luke, the fifth chapter, and verse 8 says this. 
When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And then let's read Matthew 26 and verse 33. This is kind of the flip side of the coin. Matthew 26, I know you're already there. And verse 33, it says, Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. So Christ is telling him, you are going to deny me three times. You're going to turn your back on me. Peter says, not so, Lord. I will never turn my back on you. I will never stumble. Others may fall short, but I will never fall short. So back in Luke 5 and verse 8, you remember the story. Jesus was teaching. He was in the midst of crowds. There was a great press on him. I'm sure he had a difficult time people hearing him. They didn't have modern PA systems. He comes down to the lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee. He sees two boats docked there. And he gets into one of the boats and pushes off from the shore a little bit. And he starts talking and there is a natural PA system that comes from speaking across the water. He ends his teaching and he looks at Peter and says, launch out into the deep for a catch of fish. Now Jesus they perceived as a prophet, a great man. He claimed to be God, but still he was the son of a carpenter. And these were trained professional fishermen. And Peter says, you know, we really don't want to do that. We have fished all night, and we have caught nothing. And now we are involved in the menial task of cleaning nets, all of the seaweed, all of the junk that gets gathered in nets, which is not easy work, all of the barnacle. I don't even, I'm not a fisherman, so why should I even try? But... Uh, It was not fun work at all. Jesus says, no, launch out into the deep. And I like that Peter, to his credit, said, nevertheless, at thy word, we will let down the nets. Boy, we ought to be that way when we disagree with what God wants us to do. They let down the nets, and suddenly there was a great catch of fish, so much that the net was full, and Peter's boat began to sink. He looked over at his partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of Thunder, and he beckoned them to come over. They came side by side, parallel with him, held the other side of the net, and they slowly brought that catch of fish to shore. But Peter was wowed by that. So he's doing what he needs to do, but I have no doubt he kept staring over at Jesus. And he suddenly fell to the knees of Jesus there. And he says, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. And Jesus says, don't be afraid, Peter. From now on, you're no longer going to fish for fish. What a thing to say to a fisherman. From now on, you're going to fish for men. So that's kind of how it got going. And as we look at moving from that humility, now he's arrogant, saying, I'll never forsake you. I will never deny you. Everyone else might, but I will not. Now, last week we talked about tasting the chocolate, right? And that was understanding the process. You may be in the trench right now. You might be going through some unpleasant things, but God wants you to taste the chocolate. He wants you to know what's coming. He wants you to know about the good stuff. He wants you to know that you have enlisted in the right army, the army of God, and that things will be okay. So he had a great start, Peter. What happened? How do we do that? How do we start off in a place of humility and all of a sudden find our place in a place of arrogance? What happened? What happens to us? 
Well, James 4, 6, again, if you're taking notes, says, but God gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, I want you to understand something. No one likes to fail. I don't like to fail. I don't enjoy that, and if I do fail, I certainly don't want you to see it. It's the hardest thing in the world to admit failure. But I want you to understand there are only two paths to travel. God's plan and his course, or the course of the people that are around you in your life. When he fell to the knees of Christ, he was comparing himself to Jesus. But suddenly now he's saying, all men might deny you, but not me. I will not be one of those ones. But we know he would fail. We know he would deny the Lord three times. Unspeakable. We never would think of Peter of doing that. But understand, God will teach us through failure. He doesn't say we won't fail. He prays that our faith will not fail. Now, if you have children or grandchildren, I learned something as a dad when my kids were small. Every now and then, they would try some things that they should not try. And they would run for a little bit, and all of a sudden they would trip, or they'd stumble, or they'd fall down the steps, or they'd conk their head on something. And if you watch them closely, their face would get bright red. And most of the time, you check this out if you have little ones around you, they would look to you first. They'll kind of look at mom, they'll kind of look at dad, they'll look at grandpa or grandma to see what your reaction is. Now, when I was an inexperienced father, I would say, oh, you poor thing, you poor little baby, what did you hurt your head? And they would burst into tears, and it was worse. But over time, I matured. And I learned what I was supposed to say. And I would look at my little kids, little two-year-olds, and I'd say, you're okay. That didn't hurt. You're a big boy. Don't worry about it. And I'd start to laugh, and they would most of the time start to chuckle, unless it was serious. And then we would know that that test didn't work. Listen, Jesus knows we're going to fall, we're going to fail, we're going to have rough times. And Jesus doesn't want us to stay in the midst of that failure. He doesn't want that emotional pot to be stirred up that we walk around saying, oh, poor me, and I have this, and I have that, and I'll never get out of this thing, and this has happened to me because... 20 years ago or 40 years ago, this happened, and I can't gain any victory over it. Jesus wants to say, you're okay. Get up. Move on. Grow. How can we help anyone else if we are consumed with our own failure and we never move on to a place of victory? Right? Does God want us to do that? We'll notice in a few moments that uh, we can fall a bunch of times and yet still get up. Secondly, we must realize that there are times we will fail. In our text, as I just mentioned, Proverbs 24 and verses 16 to 18 teach us that lesson. Proverbs 24 and verses 16 to 18, it says, For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. Do not rejoice when your enemy fails. Do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Hey, most people know that the number seven is the number of completeness, finality in the word of God. So when God says a righteous man can fall seven times and rise again, it means he can be a complete, 
failure and still get up. Do you need to get up this morning? Do you need to dust yourself off with the grace of God and say God's ready to use me again and he wanted me to learn this from this experience? Or are we stirring the pot of our emotions and telling everybody our story rather than moving on? I love when Christ showed up with people who had infirmities. And he would say, what is it that you want me to do for you? And he would say that to people who were blind, people who were crippled, people who were deaf. He knew what they needed, but he knew the problem rested with them concerning what they would do or would not do with the problem or with the failure. We have to say, Lord, you can make this right. Lord, you can take care of this. Lord, you can give me the victory, and I can be a complete failure and yet rise again. Becoming a disciple requires us to understand we will sometimes fail Jesus. Should we name all the people in Scripture? Should we name the Davids and the Jacobs and point out their failures and not realize that David could still be called a man after God's own heart? even though he had so many great failures. Hey, what are the risks involved in failure? I don't want to talk about that. That depresses me. Well, I know, but hang with me. You'll be home soon, and everything will be okay. When we fail, there's discouragement. I'm not talking about clinical discouragement, per se, but we get discouraged. We don't like to fail. Sometimes we quit when we fail something, right? We started something. Some of you, and I've met some people, you start a bunch of things. But as soon as there's a little adversity or a problem or scrutiny from somebody, we quit. We become discouraging to others because they're watching your life. And they want to know about Jesus when you go through hard times. Because anybody can serve God when you have all the money you need and you're not sick and your car's working properly, right? Anybody can serve God then. Relationships are good. Anyone can serve God in those situations. People are watching to see what you do when calamity strikes. Is God there for you then? Can we lean on him then? Or we simply retreat to our comfort zone. We forget the growth we've experienced in Christ and we go back to what feels comfortable. Even if it wasn't so good. Remember the children of Israel in the wilderness? When they whined, when they complained, they said, oh, the locks, the bagels, the flesh pots, back in Egypt, oh. Why do we fantasize and only see the positive in the past? Did they forget the taskmaster's whip? Did they forget they couldn't worship God the way they wanted to? Why does Satan cause people just to see through a certain scope only a little bit and not the whole picture? Hey, if you're in Christ this morning, you know your life is better now. You know anything that's happened that's been catastrophic or a problem was because of our mistakes. God does not fail you. God does not fail me. God wants us to learn and grow through our failure. Now in John 21 verses 1 to 3, we won't read that right now, after Peter's threefold denial of Jesus is foretold, broken and discouraged, Jesus is now the resurrected Christ. He doesn't know what to do with his life now. He had given three years of his life to Christ, and he loved him. And now he didn't know what to do, so he decides to return to his comfort zone. He looks, maybe we should turn there. Turn to John 21, 1 to 3, if you have a Bible. Because he's got some good guys around him who he can either build them up or he can pull them down by the decisions that he makes. 
And in John 21, verses 1 to 3, let's read that together. It says, After these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. And I want to take a stutter step there. After the resurrection, he only appeared to believers. Amen? Before the crucifixion, he talked to everybody, didn't he? Now he is appearing to his own. Verse 2 says, Simon Peter, who's there? Thomas called the twin. Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, remember him? He was a disciple in whom there was no guile, no hypocrisy. The sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two others of his disciples. One had to be John, because John never mentioned himself. They were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing, and he meant for fish. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Gee, that sounds kind of familiar. If we go back to Luke, the fifth chapter, isn't that how it all began? When Jesus was dealing with Peter, and he found out that they had toiled all night but caught nothing, Jesus said, cast the net on this side of the boat for a great catch. Now the resurrected Christ from the shore yells out to the guys in the boat, and they're very discouraged and despondent. Their Savior has been crucified. And he says, children, children, have you caught anything? And they said, nothing. Professional fishermen. Why don't you cast the net on the other side of the boat? They did. I wonder if Peter, as he heard that, was thinking, huh, because he didn't recognize Jesus yet. That sounds kind of familiar. And we haven't caught anything. And here we are fishing for fish when we were told we wouldn't fish for fish anymore. Suddenly there's a great catch, and John's watching the shore. He's a, he's a perceptive, loving one. He said, it is the Lord. And Peter, impulsive Peter, <sighs> throws off his outer coat and dives into the water to swim towards Jesus, because suddenly he realizes this flashback comes to mind of what was said before when he started with Jesus, and the same thing is being told now, and he has a chance to make it right. Remember he wept bitter tears when he denied the Son of God? And you know what I like? As he's swimming to shore, Jesus is on the beach. I don't know if he had, uh, you know, a hibachi grill or what he had. What's the real expensive grill? Nobody knows. Yeah, what? I don't know. But Jesus is cooking. He's cooking fish. Where did Jesus get the fish? They didn't come in with the fish yet. How come Jesus has fish? Well, I guess he's the Son of God. I guess all of their needs will be met by the Son of God. I guess he didn't have to cast a net into the sea because he's the Son of God. And Peter could have been in the Olympics swimming to shore. He can't wait to get to Jesus because all he was tasting in his mouth was failure and bitterness. And he knew that things could be made right. Hey, Peter, do you remember Luke 5, 10 at the end? Do not be afraid. From now on, you'll fish for men. What are you doing out there? This isn't my purpose for you. I have a greater purpose. You're to learn through failure. I prayed that your faith would not fail. Has it? No need for it to because your faith rests in the Son of God. 
So the springboard for the event with trained fishermen was that they caught nothing. Is it any different now that the broken Peter went back to the fishing boats? Hey, what's your comfort zone? Yeah, let's just go back and do what we were doing. Let's get out of that church. Somebody bugged me. I'm annoyed. I knew it wouldn't work. You know, when we judge God by imperfect people. I don't come to church because of all the hypocrites. Yes, we have a lot of them. Right? Every church does. We have hypocrites. We have failures. We have losers. But we're in the right place beneath the preaching of the Word of God, the supernatural Word of God that will change us. Isn't that great? One writer, unknown writer, said the path to restoration is always through brokenness. I don't want the heat turned up. I don't want to be broken. I don't want to go through rough times. If you want to end up more like Jesus, you'll have to embrace those times. You will have to share in the sufferings of Christ in order to be able to grow. The final point this morning, it's good to be sincere, but you can be sincerely wrong. And we have a lot of people we love that are good people. Some lost people, I get along with lost people many times better than Christians. I give them the benefit of the doubt. I know they don't have the Holy Spirit living in them. But sometimes you meet people that are just, you look at them and you say, this ought to be a Christian. They're so sweet. They're so giving. They're so lovable. You know, and it's the Christian sometimes that's nasty. And they've been broken down by the cares of the world. And they can't get over stuff. We need to. Our faith should not fail. It's good to be sincere, yet we can be sincerely wrong. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12 says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We need to do it God's way. Peter had a problem on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember that? Lord, it's good that we're here with you and Moses and Elijah Let's build three memorials honoring each of you. And then the voice says, This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. And Moses and Elijah, like the cartoons go, bleep, and they're gone. But who remained? Jesus. Jesus was still there. So Peter failed there. But that was okay. God was bringing him along. Peter rebukes Jesus when he talks about the cross. And what does Jesus say to him? Yet behind me, Satan. That was rough. I wouldn't have wanted to have heard that. But it was a necessary process for Peter to grow in the things of Christ. Peter was sincere. He was strong. He was impulsive. He was now learning how to be made new in Christ by God chiseling away at his rough edges. Nothing greater than humility and a teachable spirit as Jesus chisels away at our rough areas. You've got to leave that up to God. I've never woken up and said to Karen, I'm going to work on my humility today. Just watch me go. Then come home at the end of the day and tell her everything I did to be humble. Would that be believable? And unfortunately, she would let me have it. And she would let me know how ridiculous I was. Listen, when you meet up with people who are humble and have a teachable spirit, you know, most of the time they don't even realize it. They're just walking in Christ, they're just doing the right thing, they're just loving the Lord. They're just taking failure and making sure that their faith in Jesus does not fail. Listen, we don't need to give the wicked one any victories. 
We need to have our victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. What does God want me to embrace and learn from my failures? Right now, we're in the midst of some failure. You know, I don't know all of your failures. You just look so good this morning. You know, you look like you're on top of your game. But I can't see your heart. I can't see what you're thinking. I can't perceive where you've fallen short. What does God want you and I to embrace through our failures? We can't camp there. We've got to get by them. Jonah had to yell out, salvation is of the Lord, get me out of here. Right? He needed to get out. There's something to learn and something to move on from. That was then and this is now. God desires healing and growth and restoration as we become more like Jesus, but he'll have to turn up the heat. He'll have to allow some failing to come into your life. Don't ignore it. Don't sweep it under the rug. Embrace it and say, Lord, what do you want me to learn through this? James 1 says that we shouldn't pray for deliverance, but we should pray for wisdom. Why is this happening? I want to be more like Jesus when I come out on the other side. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Just for a moment. And thank you for, for listening the way that you did. I'm just uh, a failure up here talking to other people who fail. But our victory comes from Christ. Thank God we have a Savior who does not fail. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Maybe you're here today and you might say, Pastor Gary, my emotions that have been stirred up, the pot has been stirred because of failure. I can't seem to get by things. And I need the power of God. I don't want my faith to fail. I don't want to stand before God one day and, and know that I could have had victory in areas, but I never achieved it. We will not achieve victory in the power of our flesh. We need Jesus to renew and restore and revitalize us. Pastor Gary, something from the Word of God, something mentioned, stirred my heart, and I need to do something with God. Pray for me today. Thank you, dear Tim. Thank you. Thank you, dear lady. Thank you, brother. I need to do something. I need to look at my faith, my life, my situation different than I've ever looked at it before. I am stuck. Pray for me. Thank you, dear lady. Thank you. Pray for me. Thank you, dear lady. Thank you. Just raise it to God. I'm not going to embarrass you or say where you're sitting. Maybe you're here and you might say, Pastor, I'm not sure I know Christ as Savior. I'm not sure if I died right now, if I'd go to heaven. I'm concerned about that. By my uplifted hand, I'd like you to pray for me. Again, I won't embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. Someone like that today. Examine yourself to see if you're of the faith. I don't know. I hear people's testimonies, but only you know if the Spirit of God is conferring with your own spirit that you are the children of God, that you are indwelt presently by His Holy Spirit. Maybe you just need some assurance. Maybe you need some discipling. Whatever it would be, I'm not sure, and it bothers me. Pray for me. Hey, Pastor, I have someone on my heart right now who needs Jesus. Just keep me in prayer that I could reach out to them. Anybody like that? Yeah, hands all over. Amen. They need Christ, not, not us. They need Jesus. I see your hand, brother. Father, we thank you that we could be here today. And Lord, we're just weak little men and women. We say the wrong things, we think the wrong things, we go in the wrong direction, we get stuck. And Lord, I know it as well as anyone. We need the grace of God. We need you to do something from the inside out that only you can do. Be with these dear folks, the hands that have been raised, the decisions 
that will be made. Even in the recesses of our own mind, even as we crawl into our own prayer closets, might we take the message today and do something with it. We love you, and we thank you for loving us first. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.